Hello. Welcome to this talk on post-traumatic hydrocephalus. That is hydrocephalus following head injury. It would be ideal if I could in this talk give you a complete picture regarding hydrocephalus following head injury and frame it with the relevant references. However, the literature on post-traumatic hydrocephalus is incomplete. In fact, there's a paucity of studies on this subject and there are many missing information regarding this condition. Furthermore, because of the use of different definitions for hydrocephalus, different definitions for ventriculomegaly, the study populations in different studies being different in terms of their constituency of severe, mild and moderate head injury patients. The literature on post-traumatic hydrocephalus is somewhat confusing. In this talk, I will try to put together the clinically relevant points that we could glean from the current literature on post-traumatic hydrocephalus. However, the picture still would remain incomplete. As with many areas in neurosurgery, there is no consensus on what is hydrocephalus and what is ventriculomegaly. Following trauma, there can be large ventricles, that is ventriculomegaly, with raised intracranial pressure, which would be the classical hydrocephalus. That would be this red circle. There can also be large ventricles with normal or reduced intracranial pressure which responds to shunting. This would be a type of secondary normal pressure hydrocephalus, secondary to head injury. Then there could be large ventricles following head injury from cerebral atrophy, which is called ex vacuo hydrocephalus. A proportion of patients with ex vacuo ventriculomegaly are also likely to have concurrent high pressure hydrocephalus. This will be this intersection. And another proportion of patients with ex vacuo ventriculomegaly are also likely to have concurrent normal pressure hydrocephalus secondary to head injury. That will be this intersection. So trying to differentiate between these five groups of hydrocephalus in clinical, in clinical practice can be very difficult. It can also be very difficult in research studies leading to confusing and contradictory uh, results. In 1996, Anthony Mamaru and his colleagues published a paper in the Journal of Neurosurgery suggesting that CSF dynamic studies could be used to differentiate between the ex vacuo hydrocephalus and the secondary normal pressure hydrocephalus. They were using the CSF outflow resistance from CSF dynamic studies to differentiate these two groups. However, in that paper they defined these parameters, however, they did not validate it. That is, they said that patients with high CSF outflow resistance and normal ICP are likely to be secondary normal pressure hydrocephalus and those patients with normal ICP but with normal CSF outflow resistance are likely to be ex vacuo hydrocephalus. However, they did not shunt both these groups of patients and see that the shunt response correlated with this type of classification based on the 
CSF outflow resistance. The incidence of post-traumatic hydrocephalus greatly varies from 0.7% as reported by Cardoso and Sam Galbraith et al. to 45% as in the series of Massini et al. This variability of the incidence is due to many factors. These include the use of different definitions for hydrocephalus and assessing the incidence of hydrocephalus in patients with differing severity of head injuries and because of different lengths of follow-ups in different studies. The studies into incidence might have different distribution of head injury severity. Severities are generally divided into three groups, severe, moderate and mild head injuries. Also, the different studies might use different definitions for hydrocephalus. Some might consider ventricular megaly as a definition for hydrocephalus. Some might consider hydrocephalus as ventricular megaly with raised pressures. And other studies might also include ex vacuo hydrocephalus as part of hydrocephalus. Also, the follow-up might vary between studies and the imaging parameters for definition of ventricular megaly also can vary between studies. These all lead to great heterogeneity in the literature on post-traumatic hydrocephalus. Poco et al. found that 25% of the patients with moderate head injury developed post-traumatic hydrocephalus, whereas this rate increased to 39% in patients with severe head injury. Debonis et al. undertook VP shunting in 15 patients that they suspected of having post-traumatic hydrocephalus. However, only seven of these patients responded. This implies the other eight patients had suffered from hydrocephalus ex vacuo. You can see from this that the definition of what you consider hydrocephalus will have an effect on the incidence of post-traumatic hydrocephalus. The results from another study which shows the incidence of hydrocephalus against time. The first seven days, 10 people, patients developed hydrocephalus in this cohort. Or from day eight to one month, another 19 patients developed hydrocephalus. And in the second month, 23 patients developed post-traumatic hydrocephalus. So how long you follow the, up these patients also has an effect on the incidence of post-traumatic hydrocephalus. The graphs you see in this slide have been constructed based on the data published by TN et al. The graph on the left shows the cumulative incidence of the post-traumatic hydrocephalus against months since the injury. It's a sigmoid shaped curve with the steep ascent over the second to fourth months. The graph you see on the right hand side is the same, based on the same data, however plotted as monthly incidence. The peak incidence is at three months, but the peak incidence is from two to four months. This is the period usually patients are discharged from neurosurgical service to neuro rehabilitation. Furthermore, you can see that even after eight months, new patients with new hydrocephalus are being diagnosed, although the rate is tailing off. This graph is again based on the data of TN et al. This is again a cumulative graph. You can see 
about 50 percent of the post-traumatic hydrocephalus is occurring after three months from the head injury so it's important to carefully follow up patients with head injury particularly the severe head injuries what are the risk factors for post-traumatic hydrocephalus once again as a paucity of studies or well-designed studies on this question. There's a consensus that increased age is associated with increased incidence of post-traumatic hydrocephalus. There's conflicting evidence in the literature as to the influence of traumatic subarachnoid blood and decompressive craniectomy in the development of post-traumatic hydrocephalus. Interestingly, studies have shown that admission, GCS and gender do not have any influence on the incidence of post-traumatic hydrocephalus. This table shows the risk factors for post-traumatic hydrocephalus studied in three of the best studies. It shows consensus on the increased age being a risk factor but there is conflicting evidence on the presence of traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage and decompressive craniectomy. What would happen if all patients with suspected hydrocephalus are shunted? In three studies which had carefully looked at this, the success rate with shunt implantation in suspected post-traumatic hydrocephalus varied from 47% to 65%. While we know surgical procedures for CSF diversion is not without its complications, the shunt operation in head injury patients might be associated with greater risk of complications. One study reported a complication rate as a has 42%. If we shunted all patients with suspected hydrocephalus, we might have a sizable proportion of patients who are unlikely to respond to the shunt but would be exposed to the complication complications of shunting. There is also attended expense of additional surgery and management of its complications. However, it is vital that we rule out treatable hydrocephalus in patients with ventricular megaly following head injury. The guidelines of the Royal College of Medicine for diagnosing vegetative state or minimally conscious state requires treatable structural causes including hydrocephalus be excluded. prior to a diagnosis of vegetative state or minimally conscious state is made. Is there any tests that we could use to predict shunt response in patients with ventricular megaly and normal or low intracranial pressure following head injury? While in normal pressure hydrocephalus many tests have been studied for their predictability for shunt response in secondary normal pressure hydrocephalus related to head injury there is a paucity of studies regarding useful tests two tests that have been studied well uh, cystonography and CSF dynamic studies. In the studies on CSF cystonography in predicting shunt responders, all the studies have shown it is not a reliable test for shunt responders. What about CSF dynamic study in differentiating between patients with 
secondary normal pressure hydrocephalus, secondary to head injury, and those with ex vacuo hydrocephalus. In fact, there's only one good study on this, and that is from De Bonis et al. from Rome. They studied 15 patients with suspected symptomatic ventriculomegaly. And in all these patients, they undertook CSF dynamic study as well as undertook CSF diversion procedures. When they looked CSF outflow resistance as a predictor, they found that all patients with CSF outflow resistance that was greater than 10 were responders. However, four of the non-responders had a CSF resistance also higher than 10 millimeters per mercury per mil per minute. This will put the accuracy of CSF outflow resistance as a predictor for shunt responsive hydrocephalus at 73%. What about cerebral elastins as a predictor of shunt response? Shunt response. All the patients who were non-responders had an elastins that was less than 0.3. However, four of the patients who were responders to shunts were, did also have a elastins that was less than 0.3. So again the accuracy of elastins as a predictor of shunt response is around 73%. So at the end of this talk on post-traumatic hydrocephalus, what conclusions can we draw? The first conclusion that we can draw is on the incidence of post-traumatic hydrocephalus. It peaks around two to four months after head injury, however, new post-traumatic hydrocephalus can be diagnosed even eight months after the head injury. Therefore, it is important to follow these patients up carefully. The second point that we can make is that even today, differentiating between hydrocephalus, carcephalus ex vacuo and secondary normal pressure hydrocephalus following head injury still remains difficult both in the research and clinical settings. The third observation that we can make is that the accuracy of CSF studies in picking up shunt responders even by teams which have experience in undertaking CSF dynamic studies is only about 73%. So what we can say is that Post-traumatic hydrocephalus requires further carefully controlled studies to tease out the risk factors and who might be shunt responders. This talk is an excerpt of the invited lecture I gave on CSF disorders in head injured patients at the World Congress of Neurosurgery of the WFNS in Istanbul on the 21st of August 2017. Thank you for your kind attention and I hope you found the lecture of use. Wishing you a good day. Bye for now.